Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to uh, the MC Scout Happy Hour here with uh, myself and Eric Doyle, uh, your two hosts for tonight's Happy Hour. Eric, are you with us? I can hear you now. Little problems there, but Sorry we're for coming through. everybody. We've had a little uh, technical difficulties getting Eric uh, all all interneted up here, but he's he's with us. So uh, we found the country, Virginia countryside. You know, I hear a little you. back. Yeah, it happens, but uh, glad to have you. And uh, before we get going on our happy hour here, hopefully everybody has a drink, ready to talk about some MC Scow sailing from the train wreck regatta. But before we get to it, um, here's a good picture of our friends, Matt and Lisa. Um, everyone who's on here, you know, our little public service announcement, if you have not paid your class dues, you know, the MC Scow class does an awesome job of promoting the class and social media and getting regatta organized and photography and info out on the internet and all this stuff. So if you haven't paid your class dues for 2021, pay them. If you didn't pay in 2020, be nice and pay for 2022. You know, the class needs the money. All the classes need the support they can get. We all love sailing MC scows. And if you have the opportunity, just, just uh, make sure you pay your dues. The nationals are coming up quick and you know, these classes all do a great job to support our sailing and we need to do likewise back. So if you can just go onto the website and pay your class dues. So with that, Eric, we were at the train wreck last week with a bunch of our friends. Um, how was your first trip to Lake Eustis? Lake Eustis was great. Uh, you know, I was a little disappointed, Al. You kept telling me about the snakes and the alligators and that it was all, I was going to see them and we'd have to like run from them in the parking lot and all, but I, I, I didn't see one. So I, I, I think you were lying to me. No, I've, I've, I saw them the last time, but we were there and it was, uh, it was good. We great. Got I like Lake Eustis uh, Sailing Club. That was great. It looks like a great venue. Everybody likes uh, the fact that there's very few power boats. And uh, when the breeze comes in, it's pretty nice. Really nice. And uh, for those of you guys who are out there don't know, we uh, Eric and I took the week uh, three days before the event and got a few of our buddies together, um, including uh, Matt Fisher, Al Hager, uh, Chris, and Sean Bradley and uh, Ken Felis and a few other guys. And we did some sail testing and some training. And uh, we learned a lot about the boat. It was really good from tuning and, and just some technique things. And, um, you know, sailed a fun regatta. And I think it was really good because we were able to learn a lot. And, you know, for me, I'm semi new to the class. So my learning curve is like this right now, going straight up and just learning all the time. And it was really awesome to have Eric there. So, uh, you know, we he and I were batting around what to talk about this happy hour. And, and um, one thing for you guys who are out there before I keep going in the chat box, feel free to send your questions. Eric and I will fire away um, at them as we get them. Um, don't hold back. We're, we're here to ask, answer questions and go at it. But so Eric, first thing we'll talk about what we learned at Eustace. And um, one of the things was tuning. So you and I sail a bunch of different boats and the MC uh, tuning guide is something you and I are working on. And we hope to actually, put a new tuning guide out in the next week or so. Um, but what are some of the things you and I talked about, you know, just tuning wise, how to make it easier and things that we looked at on a way to move forward here? Yeah. One thing we incorporated from other classes was uh, basically an arc measurement where uh, a lot of boats you can measure from the top of the mast to the transom. And that's, you know, that works pretty well. But uh, I think a little easier way is when you undo the four stay and uh, bring it to the top of the band on the mass, as you can see uh, Sean doing here, and then you hook it back up and, and uh, measure up from the deck. You know, it's pretty easy to do. You just need a ruler. You don't have to worry if you're, <clears throat> you know, maybe the halyard is a different length. You have a different length shackle or, you know, you pull really hard on the tape measure or, you know, how hard do you pull on it? You pull really hard, a little hard. Is it flapping in the breeze? You know, are you into the wind? Is the tip bending? You know, there we have it, uh, just a, a very accurate way to reproduce it. Uh, yeah. And you see it right away. Uh, that'll yeah. be included in the tuning guide. And then, you know, Al was, was very upset that the tuning guide mentioned that you, you know, you make the shrouds hand tight. So we started putting a loose gauge on them, uh, getting up to a number. They're, they're pretty loose in the normal sailing condition, but we decided, you know, we would get it up to 15 on either side and then take two full turns off. And that's a, that's a pretty accurate way. You know, we do that 
do that in the etchels on the on the lowers as well. You know, we we get it to you know 16 and take four full turns off or something like that. You know, whatever the number is, depending on what kind of uh, what kind of turnbuckles you have. It seems like all these boats have the large stay masters, so that seems like a pretty good uh, starting point. Yeah, I mean, for me, I you're right. The hand tight thing, everybody's got a different judge of that or, or three inches of sway or whatever it is. But we found what was good for us is we started, we wound the rig up to 15. We backed two turns off, went sailing and kind of figured out if we were happy or not. We figured that's at least a, a reference point we all can agree on, right? So at least now if we have 15 minus two turns, if someone was sailing that day and they're like, oh, I was fast at 15 minus one turn or 15 minus two turns and you know, two faces or two and a half turns or whatever, at least now we all have a common reference point. To me, the whole hand tight thing and then half a turn up, half a turn down, we never really knew where we were equal. So I actually think it's a pretty good way for all of us to have a good baseline setting, 15 minus two, and and we all go from there. So um, I know like for me, I kind of figured out in the really light stuff, it was two minus two and a half when we were drifting if I was on the rail, it was the minus two. As I started hiking, maybe it went to one and a half or one. And when it was really windy, I actually got back up to that 15 number. But it kind of gave us a good reference point, which I think you and I both agreed with, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, right now I'm going to jump right into a, a, a question that someone uh, emailed in this afternoon, which kind of runs into the whole uh, rig tuning that we started with. And that was... Uh, you know, the thoughts on, on spreader sweep, because we learned a little bit there as well. Well, quite a lot, you know, the spreaders are kind of, you know, just the whole mast on the, on the MC is quite unique and that there's just one set of shrouds. There's no lowers. There is a set of spreaders, but which you can adjust the sweep on, on the, with the newer spreader bracket. Uh, but there's also varying lengths of the spreaders and uh, kind of looking at it. A lot of the boats had, had, varying lengths of spreaders and when the spreaders are are not maximum length they don't really you know they don't really poke out onto the, sh the shroud very much so the boats that have maximum length spreaders which i think is 18 inches you know that that adds more load to the base of the spreader and i think when the when it's very windy and you're using a lot of boom bang you know loading the base of the spreader is probably going to be better so it keeps the mass from turning inside out as quickly. It stiffens the section, gives you a flatter sail, more leech tension. But when we're when we're talking about spreader sweep, we got to remember that if you make the spreaders longer, you, you you are effectively adding sweep because the spreaders poke back further. Uh, I think the standard number that you know Al was running with, he didn't have max length spreader was was four inches a good starting point you know every section is a little different but i think as long as everybody knows where they start and then kind of feel you know how the boat's going and then you know guys with longer spreaders at, at, at 18 inches maybe another half three quarters or half inch you know basically adds a half an inch of sweep you know so you know and in general the more sweep you have generally the mass bends a little bit more uh, the less sweep you have, they go forward. It restricts the bend in the middle of the mast, makes it a little stiffer. Uh, I'm not saying we have a magic number yet. We have a good starting point. We felt yeah. like uh, Al felt like he was going pretty good at four inches of sweep. Really good, uh, yeah. and most we were we were you know batting around the idea that when it's really really light, which you guys race in a lot, you know the sail doesn't really stretch. Maybe we'd like a little more bend. Maybe we'd sweep him back. But I think a good all around starting number. 18 inch spreaders max length spreaders is four and a half inches right and if you're you know if there's the standard spreaders it's like four yeah yeah and standard I, you know, basically my takeaway was how to get the tuning to get it simplified right and and so we we kind of simplified that part we we figured out a way to accurately measure the head stay and the rake and the shrouds but the other thing we kind of took away was measuring the board angle and we're not saying we know exactly which board angle is correct perfectly yet but the one thing I know that was key for me was at least taking a measurement. We, I forget what the exact measurement was. Maybe it was like a hundred degrees or something like that, 103 degrees, but we marked on the boat where the boards were even. So at least then I knew on tack to tack, if I set on those marks, the boards are at least down the same amount. And I had it staggered a little bit from there. So at least it wasn't like 
I was just throwing the board down kind of recklessly and not really knew where it was. And I think that was actually pretty key was just having symmetrical boards more than anything that, you know, I'm not saying the angles, you know, you can play with the angles all you want, but I think having them symmetrical was really important. I don't know what you think. About yeah. That, but and I, I, I think out a lot. First time he'd raised his boat and he was feeling different tack to tack and we turned the boat on its side and we're like, oh, well, here we go. One board was down much further than the other one. So right. getting that equal and, and repeatable, you know, repeatable marks on the yeah. deck or the line, very important. Yeah, hugely important. And um, yeah, it was good, really good. So um, one of the things we we're talking about is technique here. And these are, you know, obviously my least favorite position is sitting to lured. But it was interesting. So we did a lot of sailing early in the week in this light condition. And clearly we raced in this, right, Eric? And, um, you know, Alan, okay. Chris, our buddies, Alan and Chris were out with us early in the week. And boy, they were really fast in this light stuff. And like my big takeaway was just how steady they are on the helm and how good they are at keeping their heel angle. So you were in the coach boat. You were hammering me. You're like, Al, you know, you're you literally are a train wreck at this, you know. <laughs> and that was one of the things we worked on. So I don't know, chat a little bit about. That's what I took away. I don't know what you took away from the coach boat, but yeah. they were really good at it. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were very good. They were very consistent, keeping the heel angle the same uh, when the puffs came, uh, not moving the tiller a whole lot, being very locked in and, and leaving the heel angle consistent for, for, you know, long periods of spot uh, of time, you know, going, going up wind. You, know, you can see the, the picture on the left, Al's got, he's, it's very light air. There's, you know, almost no wind, but he's right at the maximum amount of heat. He looks very comfortable, doesn't he? I mean, very comfortable. He should just keep so that position for a couple of miles or something like that. Point. And he's got just a little bit of helm, not too much, but the, the boat should be easy to track like that as we, you know, as we lose helm, the bow tends to wander a bit. It's harder to keep it in line. He's got the sail, you know, from the little bit of sail we can see, you know, the telltales are flowing and uh, he's going okay. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that the picture on the right, one thing we tried, you know, looking off the boat, you know, the bow is really out of the water. And on most boats, when it's really light, we're just always squeezing forward, way forward, way forward, sink the bow, maximize the water line. You know, as we know, as we all know, the, the longer the boat is, the, the faster it goes and anything we can do to make it maximum water line we're, we're going to go faster not quite so much with the scow you can see al we got him in front of the traveler sitting way forward and the bow really sunk down but since the bow is so wide you know it's not like a, a regular keel boat where it comes to a point you know that portion of the bow is is so wide it's pushing the boat to weather yeah and when it pushes the boat to weather it generates a lot of weather helm and the boat goes slower because he's got to depower somehow, you know, first it gets a lot of helm, you try and sail it flatter. Well, that doesn't work in a scow because we want the bows to be, the, the boards to be vertical. So the picture on the right, we're, we're too far forward there. Yeah, So for sure. Look, you know, especially if you have a crew and I would say it looks from off the boat, like you should everybody get forward, forward, but it, it generates too much helm, you know, make sure you're just far enough back in the boat that the bow's just out of the water and not, not generating too much helm by the, you know, the shape of the boat. And it seemed like the, the boats with crews, you know, the crew sits close to the traveler bar too. It's actually like keeping the crew weight near the traveler bar um, seemed to be really good. So just going back, we got, we did get one question about measuring the boards um, with the enclosed boat. So what we did um, is we turned the boat on its side and measured it with a protractor to get them even. Um, if you have an enclosed boat, I guess you would just mark the board lines to know exactly where they are. I did a tick marks on the opening on the board well. You can't really see it on here, but um, I just put tick marks on the opening where the head of the board went through to keep them even. Um, and so I had like three marks. I had one where the board was down, two even spots where they were down. I had a mark where the boards were up, but just so the whole back edge of the board was down. So it looked like a full uh, V-shaped triangle on the bottom of the boat. That was my second mark. And then I just kind of made a mark halfway between to kind of guess where halfway down was. But those were the three marks I put on there. And I think it was pretty important. So if you have an enclosed boat, I think we do, you turn the boat aside, you measure the angles, and then you just mark the, uh, the lines so you know where they're even. I think that's probably the best way to do it, um, at least in my estimation. So we'll kind of keep going here. So 
this is a windy day and obviously I'm not hiking because I just don't um, and I need to. But really um, sad, Al. Really yeah, sad. It's, pretty, it's really sad. My all the star sailor friends of mine are laughing at me right now. But um, <laughs> in the breeze, the one thing that we we did find is that it's super important to be able to keep the boat on its feet, right? I mean, we were watching it, the boat just goes um, drastically better when it's at the right heel angle. And I think the common theme was coming back to this heel angle. Um, but even in breeze too, the, you know, the two adjustments were the Vang, which was really crucial. And we'll get to that later and the board height, believe it or not, because at the max board down in this breeze, when a puff would hit the boat would trip over itself. Like you'd see even here, like I'm easing and the boat was kind of like lurching. Whereas if I pulled the board up just that much and kept it even, the boat would, a puff would hit, the boat would just accelerate. So, you know, while the boat seems simplistic in this breeze, my biggest takeaway was you have to pay attention to the boards and breezy. And when we talk about the actual regatta, we can talk about that. But, um, you know, from off the boat, Eric saw a few things too. And, but this was a good, a good indicator of like the boat, if it's unsettled, just isn't quick, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can see Al could he could cheat out just a little bit here, but the, you know the boats we got Max Cunningham, Max Alhall, the boom starting to bend, but you know he's got the tiller locked on his thigh. You know it's not up in the air, he's not pushing it around, pulling. You know we'd like to keep it locked there, or maybe you can even another technique is is bring it behind him and lay it down on the deck and really just leave it on the deck. I, I think for a lighter a lighter boat like the MC, I like, to, I can have it up on my thigh on a, on a big, heavy, like a keel boat, like an Etchell's, I'll, I'll actually plant it on the deck and just leave it there. Cause we want the boat to do the work, right? We, we want the, we want to trim it and to have it in balance. And we don't, if we have to drive the boat a lot, unless it's super shifty and really hard, we, we, we want the boat to do the majority of the work and the, the, the boat to be in balance and us not have to drive it too much. There's stretches where we have to, but we prefer to drive the boat, minimum tiller movement, mostly with the sail trim and our weight. And and my big takeaway, and you did a good job in the coaching of hammering this to all the guys who were there, is letting, no matter what the condition, was getting the boat to do the work. Like even in light air, if you're constantly moving and trying to work the angle of heel and, and the sheets and everything, the boat was just laboring, right? But if you got the boat settled and on its lines and kind of let it do its thing the, is when the boat went the quickest. So yeah, it's actually yeah. a takeaway for me was just how to let the boat do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of go here. So this is a, a, a windy photo here. This is of one of the new sails that we'll talk about here that we tested a little bit, but um, this is really shows you what the overbend from the Vang will do. And from on the boat, what's funny is from on the boat, it looked like, it was fine, right? It looked the way I would expect it to while sailing. But what was interesting, this is one of the good things about having someone there in a coach boat is Eric was able to watch, um, I, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but the bottom batten would hinge open depending on how much bang I had on, uh, basically because the sail was just over bending in this area and it would hinge open. So, you know, Eric, I don't know, maybe you want to chat about from off the boat, but it was interesting. There was definitely a mode where you needed the Vang on. If you went too far, the boat would actually slow down as well, right? And you just lose height. <clears throat> yeah, we went out and, and it was windy, but not, you know, ridiculous windy this day. And this this is our uh, our heavier sail, flatter sail. And the bottom, pull the out haul on really hard and, and get the Vang. You can actually get the bottom back, the hinge, and open up. Yeah. And we're, and we're, we're at the limit here. Say we've got the big overbend wrinkles and then we've got other ones a little bit further up that are, you know, at a 45 degree angle. So that's where the sails starting to run out of love curve or run out of sail in the front. And we're, we're reaching max mass bend. You can see all the bend that Alan has on the mass. There's a lot of bend. So we, we basically, we can't get any more shape out of the sail. You know, we, we've got it as flat as we can. And we need a little bit of, of return in the in the batten down low so that the boat will go upwind, right? We, we've, we've reached the point where we can't hold the boat down anymore. You know, we've got the Cunningham on very hard. We've got the Vang on really hard. And we've got the Traveler all the way down. So the, the exit angle of the sail is, is out past the corner of the boat. And if we go further than that, we're going to go really, really fast through the water, but we're not really going to go upwind. The 
sale needs just a little return. So I put this picture up to show that the sale will tell you, you know, and every mass is a little different, every sale, you know, slightly different, you know, as it ages a little more, maybe it shrinks a little bit, you can't pull as hard, but it, it, look at your sale, you know, pull the bang on and feel it, but he's, he's at the max limit right there. Like, I think right after this picture, I said, I'll ease the bang one inch and then just hike and play the sheet. You know, go any further and you're going to just, you're going to be going, like I said, fast through the water. You might need it sometime if you're overstood a little bit, you know, you're up high or you're in a great big lift. You want to gain bearing on somebody. You want to go fast forward over them. Yeah, really hard on the vang and you'll do it. But it's kind of dangerous if you're living in a thin lane, uh, you're coming off the starting line, you want to hold your spot. You know, this is where, you know, be careful. Don't let the bat and hinge open too much. You know, it, it's a nice weapon to have, a nice mode to have, but you got to understand when you look at the sale, what you're looking at and and what's going on with uh, with that wet bottom bat and those overbend wrinkles. Yeah, my two big takeaways, and A, this is the flatter sail. So when it was easier to get this sail to overbend, right? When I sailed with the, yeah. um, the new sail in the regatta when it got windy on Sunday, no matter how much vang I put on, I couldn't get this overbend. It would get on just the verge, but it wouldn't get, um, you know, it wouldn't get the overbend that the flatter sail would get, which is what we would expect, right? A flatter sail is going to run out of shape earlier than the fuller sail. So on this this sail in particular, maybe I had the vang three quarters of the way on, whereas with the other sail, you know, it was full on as much as I could get. And one of the things I did do after you left, Eric, is that I added some marks on the vang too, up, but you know, like where the purchase system is, um, just so I could have better references for vang tension. And I actually found it really important downwind just so I could get the sale to set up right down when and have it repeatable. Uh, it seemed to work pretty well. Um, something to think about, I think, for a lot of guys sailing the boat. Uh, one of the questions of this photo is traveler down. I think you can go, I definitely wasn't on center line. I think in this photo, I was all the way down. Um, during the racing on Sunday, I experimented being about a third of the way up. Um, and that was basically, um, seemed pretty good in that condition. So. Yeah, that would basically be what I would think. Um, yeah. So one of the questions is, is this sale flatter than the Z Max? It is flatter than the Z Max. This is um, what was the Z1 sale, um, but the, now we're calling it the Rocket. But yes, um, it is flatter than the Z Max. We're going to get to that in a little bit here. So uh, hold on. Go to the next next little thing here. So kind of thinking about the regatta, and we did a bunch of training in this condition, and and one of the things that seems pretty um, noticeable to me is that we race in a lot of light air and this is the part I struggled with and had to work hard was getting into a position where I could get my head out of the boat right and, and Eric you could talk about this early on I just struggled with the technique right I mean as we said you know this is a photo with Matt Fisher where we were out with Matt and and Sean and Chris and and every and Al and they were just kicking my butt in the light stuff early on and it wasn't like I couldn't get up to speed. It was just the transitions and the technique, right? So from off the boat, you saw the group. I mean, what was the big thing in this stuff so you could get head out of the boat? Yeah, early on, um, you know, the guys who have been sailing this winter and have sailed the boats a lot, were very smooth in the boat, transitioned very nicely. You know, this is Al's second regatta on the boat. And uh, he just wasn't comfortable because just, it's just a lack of time, and that's why it's, it's nice to get there at least, you know, one day before regatta. We can go out and see the conditions, and, and, and for a lot of people, it's just relearning and just shaking the rust off and, and getting back to the techniques that you were successful with or maybe trying to learn new techniques. You know, so the photo on the left is, is a really nice setup. You can see perfect heel angle. The rail's just out of the water. The sail's deep and powerful not over trimmed it's nice even top to bottom just enough rudder angle again you know we, we, we you know kind of take pictures from off the boat in two two main planes and one is by lining the rudder straight up with the mast so we're right on center line and then another one will be straight down the boom so you can see the depth of the sail and this one's right on center line because like we can see the helm you know, we don't like to have lee helm in weather in, in light air. You know, we like it to be straight or just the tiniest bit, but nice and straight. And then, you know, we showed this picture on the top because that's, 
you know, you can see how it's it's blatantly obvious that, you know, there's a puff coming and it's coming soon. And how long does it last? And beyond that, there's no more wins. So we need to think about transitioning. Okay, here comes the puff. You know, what are we going to do in the puff? We're going to try and keep the bow down. We're going to try and keep the boat at a constant angle of heel. We're going to try and go fast and accelerate. Maybe we have to ease the main just a little bit. Keep the boat getting going fast. Get it on its feet. Keep it on its feet. Then once it gets up to speed, then it's a little trim in and a little bit of height out of that. You know, the problem is sometimes it's very shifty too. Maybe it's a huge header and we've just got to bear away a lot. We got to use the tiller to do it, you know. It's a big lift. We ease the sheet. We lean in a little bit, let the boat heel and get up. But if we can get a little training, get a little few regattas under our belts, you know, we've had a long winter to where this is kind of second nature so that we, we see the puffs comes. And then once it settles down, we know, okay, are we going the right way? Are we, are we, are we in a big header or a big lift? Are we just going to stay in the breeze longest by just going straight? Or do we need to tack and go the other way? But it's, it's just getting comfortable with the transition and getting it up to speed that we can, we can go the right way. Cause we know that, uh, yeah. being on the correct tack, going toward the next puff, the most important thing in light air. Yeah. So a like, good story. This is the first race, right? The first race of the regatta, you weren't, you weren't there, you had to go, but you know, it was very similar to this and, and our training actually paid off because like, if you look at the picture on the left, I was struggling with the constant heel angle main sheet, you know, keeping the boat even thing and kind of started to get the knack of that. And the first race of the regatta, it was kind of this condition. And to be honest, I was kind of a little nervous about it because I knew it wasn't my strong suit. And I was like, you know, I just got to kind of work on two things. I'm going to get off the line as clean as I can. And, you know, I, I had this feeling I kind of wanted to work the right side, but I was like, you know, I just want to get going and get towards the front. So I had a pretty average start kind of in the boat, half of the line. I don't, I don't want to go into this forever, but you know, and, and I was just like, I started getting that uncomfortable notion again. I was like, you know, this is wrong. I just got to buckle down for 30 seconds on the heel angle and then start looking around the course again. And as soon as I did that, it was funny. The boat just started taking care of itself. Like you and I talked about, and it actually got to be where I was racing the course again, instead of monkeying around with the boat. And as soon as I was able to kind of put that a little bit more behind me, it worked out. And what was interesting is everyone kind of was fighting for the right side. And I kind of managed to skate out of being the middle right boats. You know, I started the middle of the line. I never got right hard enough and kind of towards the top, it was interesting. It started getting lighter and the whole fleet was kind of the right. And I was kind of delured of them. And it felt like the wind actually started going over the pack of boats. And I was able to kind of just scoot out and tack and get through um, and got around the mark like fourth or something like that instead of 10th. And it was, it was kind of interesting to see how just focusing on speed because a little puff and all of a sudden this boat just takes off and, and it was, it was managed to cross, um, which was good. Second beat up all of a sudden it was a huge righty and the guys who went right just crushed everybody. I mean, I was like third or fourth at the bottom, got to first, you know, I think Bill Draheim went from like 15th to second, you know, it was just how to work the course. And that's kind of where, going back to your original thing of head out of the boat is pretty crucial there. So you got to get this stuff down. Um, I, I can tell you it's hard. If you're sailing boats all the time, like, you know, we are, where you're used to sailing a boat flat, the transition to sailing a boat heeled over is really hard. Um, so I, I know for me, it was a little bit difficult, but um, what was interesting before we get onto some sail stuff and the sail testing, what we did. Um, so the last day it was interesting. It was really windy. Um, and Eric and I actually chat about it. Um, afterwards, but you know, it's pretty daunting when I was sailing by myself, you see everybody get cruise on it was really windy on Sunday. I mean, windy, like pushing the class limits at the end of the day and, you know, just figuring out how to depower the boat and, and deal with it. And there was a lot of things, you know, it's surprising. The boat seems simple, but you know, the first thing I, I basically just realized is I got to tighten everything as much as I can. So I went straight for outhaul Cunningham, and one thing to keep in mind that I learned this is that Cunningham really bends the mast. And Eric, you saw that from off the boat, right? I mean, it just bends the rig a ton pulling the Cunningham on. And, um, you know, yeah, I think if, you know, the, the thing that strikes me, you know, having very little experience with NC is like, when I look at this picture on the left, how much of the mast above the hounds is just completely unsupported. Yeah. You know, I sail a lot of fractional rig boats uh but generally the 
the shrouds go to the top of the mast. Or like a J70, they end, you know, they're the three quarters, right. seven eighths or something like that. But it has a backstay. So really, the only control we have over the top of the mast is with the sheet tension and the Cunningham. Yeah. And uh, you know, the top of that mast is waving around in the breeze like nobody's yeah. business. So the Cunningham really tightens a lot of the main, pulls down on the headboard, adds a lot of compression to the mast. You know bends it and the more yeah. the mass will bend the, the the more locked in it'll be so that's that's really good you know we had some pictures there previous where you know you almost yeah. you, you pull on it so hard you're kind of worried about it you know and the front of the sail the front inch is completely you know smooth that's when i think you got enough cunningham on you know i kind of if it's a breezy condition it's the star is very similar it's a very tall skinny mass it bends a lot and when it gets windy and I can't keep the bow down anymore, it's I just pull that Cunningham just like as hard as I can. To get the mass to bend. I might, you know, be able to let it off when I'm not overpowered. Yeah. I don't have too much helm, but, at, you know, very hard. It really settles the mass down and helps the steady the whole sail plan out nicely. Yeah. And, and just getting the Vang on. And, and the Traveler ended up being a pretty crucial adjustment, as I found, because there is a fine line between too far down to where you're reaching around the course, but if you pull it too far up, the boat starts to trip over itself a little bit. So it was actually um, pretty interesting. I, I'm, I've been thinking about it a lot the last couple of days about how to even mark the traveler so I can get some repeatable, you know, I'm debating whether to put some hash marks on the traveler bar itself or what I'm gonna do to kind of have some repeatable settings there. Cause I think it's actually pretty important to be able to repeat these things and, you know, before we go forward, you know, I appreciate that Matt Fisher is pointing out that his boat is too flat here in the right photo because, you know, Eric did a good job of making fun of me the entire week about how bad I was at sailing the boat. So I'm glad to hear Matt say that he was doing something wrong because I, I was pretty sure I didn't know how to sail anymore after after three days of coaching the group. Um, but it was now you're just ready for that puff, man. You're yeah, getting I, was ready just, that I was just I was right over the one time I was going to get him right here, but um, didn't happen, though. No. But going forward here, and it's just because we don't want to keep everyone too late here on a Friday night. So one of the goals of this uh, practice session, besides getting me better at MC sailing, was we were working on some new sails. And um, we're really excited about where our new product line is now for 2021. And we've done a bunch of work to it. So we have two new sails here um, that we have coming out, the Rocket and the Magnum, um, which is... The sail, I, I raced with the Magnum, which is the sail with the blue numbers here during the regatta. Um, and Eric can talk a little bit more about how we got there. But basically, you know, we had had the designs that we'd been selling for a while through Melgus. And obviously, they're still our designs. But we started looking at them closely and realized that there were improvements that could be made. And we could move them into a more modern design platform. Um, and you'll see kind of an example of some of the testing that was done on the MC sail in this photo here on the left um, and move it forward. This is one thing Eric really specializes in. So I was glad he was there. So I mean, Eric, maybe just chat about the process here a little bit. So everyone kind of understands what we did and we can talk about each one individually. Yeah, we took, uh, we took our successful designs from the last, you know, decade or so. We, we built a few sales and uh, had them built earlier in the spring. Uh, Al used them at the first regatta. We, we refined them a little bit and he, we changed some important details, but probably the biggest thing we did is we, you know, we put them in the North design program, which instead of the sail being designed two dimensionally, in other words, just putting curves on flat panels and joining them together. You know, we joined the, we designed the sail in a, like a CAD program. We call it the mold program. So it designs the sail three dimensionally and uh, makes for a much smoother sail. You know, the boat's the class, and the boat has been around a long time, and it's, uh, it's, it's so the sails have, have been refined and have been successful. Uh, the sails have to go through a very wide range. You know, you go from very, it's only one sail when you're out racing, and you, you, you never know, so it has to be quite dynamic. Um, so we, we put it in the mold program and ran it through the design suite. You can see an output there uh, on the left, the colored diagram that we have. The lighter colors are more shape. You can see where the, the draft position is, where the sail is fullest there. 
with the yellow, and then it's starting to get flatter with the red. Uh, it's quite flat off the mast, very straight in the back down low on the leech. Uh, so that's really nice. Uh, we have a, a, a great platform to start from. So we, we didn't really make huge changes, some subtle changes, smoothing the sail out, a lot of details, uh, windows and patches and batten pockets and headboards and cloth weight. It was yeah. quite a nice upgrade on the cloth, we think, for a all-around sail on the Magnum. Yeah. You know, the Rocket uh, is very similar to the Z1. Uh, it's a little bit heavier cloth, a little flatter sail overall, so we kind of have, you know, two options there. If you're a little heavier or it's going to be a lighter venue, you might you know, go for the Magnum. If you're a sail lighter all the time or you're going to a very windy venue, uh, you might consider the the rocket that's a little flatter. It's a little bit more durable. Uh, it might last a little longer. Uh, so, so a couple of changes, you know, on the Magnum is that it was what we called the Z-Max. And one of the things we, we've gotten a bunch of I don't know, comments about was the cloth. And one of the things we, we upgraded to was this RSQ fabric which Eric and I are very familiar with. We use it on the stars. We think it's really fantastic for sales that have to be able to go on bendy rigs and go through the range. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And, um, you know, changing the patching and changing, one of the things we're changing and it actually isn't shown fully in this photo yet is a batten length uh, to kind of adjust the draft in the middle part of the sail. Um, but we're really excited about how this sail set up and went with all the updated changes um, including putting a leech cord in there for when it's windy and things like that, really just to make it, you know, basically when Eric and I talked about this sale was how to make it as user-friendly as possible so you can get your head out of the boat, which I think for this boat, getting your head out of sailing the boat and onto the race course, especially for these lakes that we sail on, is crucial. You can't be focusing on sail trim and tuning all the time because you'll lose uh, basically sight of the big picture. Is that fair, Eric? I mean, that, that's what we geared this whole thing towards. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah, 100%. Thing. We, we, so, um, and, and the one you, thing I want to point out too about this photo, and I think it's important, we talked about sail trim earlier, is how in this light stuff, having the main sheet on enough just to bend the rig a touch is crucial in this light air. And this is the one thing is, if you let the mast straighten up too much, the sail gets too draft forward. And basically, you just can't point as high. It almost is like a laser where you have to trim and bend the rig just a touch, right? And that was the one thing we found is you just can't sheet off all the way to straighten the mask completely in this really light stuff, When especially when you're sitting the leeward. Do you agree with that, Eric? Yeah, yeah. If you look at uh, yeah. all the test sales that we did, we put, you know, horizontal draft stripes on them, which is how we can photograph right. the sails and right. quantify the positions. But it really gives you a good look at what the exact draft position is. And if you look at... Uh, the picture on the left with the M sail, yeah. and you can see the mass is quite straight, and the and the maximum depth of the sail is quite far forward, and that right. that's what's hard is that you got to bend the mast just enough. It's the only thing we have on an MC to bend the mast, and you know with we don't have any we can't get the shrouds tight enough to create any pre bend. You know, on other boats we have ways to bend it at the deck, or you know yeah. the side shrouds go to the top of the mast. We can put some shroud tension on. So all we have to bend the tip is just the main sheet. So we got to trim that just enough so that the draft isn't so knuckly way up by the front, by the mass. You know, we got to bend it just a little bit so it smooths out, but not so much that it gets the leech so tight down low that it's just all stalled, you know, and that's why it's very important to have a, a nice mark on our main sheet. You can see all the time yeah. so that we, we look up and we think, we think, okay, this is right in the ballpark. And we look down, okay, that's where my mark is. It's uh, it's just coming into the main sheet block. And we yeah. sail along, gosh, this doesn't seem very fast. We try it a little looser, we try it a little tighter, but we have a, important to have a reference point. Yeah. You know, we, we do a lot of sailing and once you kind of get going, you're fast, we gotta be head out of the boat. We can't always look up at the sail every, you know, 10 or 15 seconds, every time the wind changes to look at the sail. The, the sail's basically gonna look the same, but that, Really fine tune adjustment on our main sheet is is the critical adjustment yeah. on an MC to to really fine tune how we feel. How does the boat feel? Yeah. Okay. We're we're I agree. the marks at the cleat now, and we're going fast. All right. Let's leave it for a little while, you know, and see how it goes. And if it's windy, we trim in. If it's yeah. 
too windy and we can't hold the boat down, we put it out, but we got to be able to repeat that. And my, my big takeaway from that, Eric, and I would say this, and this will be my, I know some people will disagree, but I feel very strongly about this. You have to have the five to one main sheet adjustment on this boat. The four to one is too coarse. It's too hard to hold it when the breeze. I think you have to have the five to one. It is, to me, it's a necessary upgrade to trim the sail properly. And the main sheet is just crucial. And the adjustments in the four to one are just too big when you ease or trim that I think having like to me, it was one of my biggest takeaways from the weekend was switching to five to one was just, and I, I mean, I'm more than strong enough to pull the main sheet in. It's just a matter of having to find enough adjustment to make it so that when, you know, you know, it's, it's when you panic trim too, even it's not so big you know? and it's, it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it does the fine thing. So I actually think for those of you out there who don't have five to one, I think it's a necessity. Um, and here's a photo of the rocket, um, which was the former Z1 sail. Uh, the one thing about this sail that you'll see in the photo that's not true is we've eliminated the um, the headboards the way they're on this sail like they are now. They're an internally done headboard, so you don't see a big piece of metal sitting up there now. Um, but the one thing about this sail that was interesting to me is it's definitely a flatter sail, and it looked really nice in the breeze. But when Eric and I were measuring the shapes, I remember correctly, the bottom stripe compared to the Magnum sail or the old Z Max were almost the same depth in the bottom. This sail is just drastically flatter in mid stripe in the head, right? If I remember correctly. So I think for lighter teams, or, you know, we had a question what would you do if you were a lighter team sailing in chop and windy venue? I think this sail would be killer because it's pretty full down low. It's got a good foot shelf and it's flat up high. So if you need power to get through waves, I think this sail is going to do it and it's going to twist open really nice um, and keep the boat healed and what's interesting to me again from these photos is the sail looks so twisty but i can tell you when you're on the boat it does not feel like it's twisty it feels like you're trimming really hard so um i think if i was you know on the smaller side and was sailing in a venue where it's choppy and breezy this sail would be pretty strong because it's full low and flat high uh, is that what you felt eric yeah yeah flatter sail definitely yeah. hold the boat easier it was really nice yeah. it's got a little different panel layout you know it, it reacts a little a little more uh quickly to the out hall so you yeah. might be playing that a little bit more super nice sail look at that profile on the right it's just really sweet Great. there's there's just enough return on the lower batten to help you go up wind uh, and it, it carries you know you can see up to the numbers where it starts to twist and then yeah. the head's nice and open but there it's not you know completely washing out so you still got some drive Pretty nice. Yeah, and and it, and if it had a good foot shelf in it, so for going downwind, you could use the alcohol. It was really um, quite good. And you know, we have to give, you know, because I told them I'd do it. And this is a happy hour. We're not supposed to take this too seriously. So we gotta, you know, come clean and say that this is Sean Bradley's, you know, naming of these two sails after a few too many hours at the uh, what was that place called the Oyster Trough? Oyster then, Trough. Yeah, this is where the two two new sail names came out. So he gets credit for that, but. Um, you know, one of the things I was talking about as folks are coming up, what's going on here, and we're getting ready for the next few regattas. So there's a regatta in Sarasota in um, a couple weeks here, and then the midwinters are coming up. And, uh, and then the, the big regatta out east will be the Eastern Championships, which if you're from the Midwest, you should come out because that's where the 20, uh, the date's wrong, it should be 2022 Nationals, not 2021, um, are going to be in New Jersey in 2022. So unfortunately, all the uh, lake sailors are going to have to get your boat salty for the nationals. You're going to have to deal with it for a couple of regattas, but it's a cool venue and you're going to get some good breeze and some good chop and you get to go hang out at the boardwalk in Jersey and see some crazy scenes, but it's an awesome place to go sailing. <laughs> Eric was there at a star regatta, so he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And, uh, and then we go to the nationals in Iowa here. So um, pretty busy time here for the MC class and, what's going on. And I know we're psyched to do it. I'm going to hit all these events and um, yeah, just looking forward to it. Great seeing the class doing so well, you know, 57 boats at a, at a weekend regatta and, you know, a lot yeah. of new boats purchased and a lot of excitement uh, throughout the whole COVID thing. It's really, really taken off and giving it a little shot in the arm with a great yeah. uh, leadership from the class and everything and good officers that are really pumping it up. It's great to see. Yeah. 
My, and it was impressive too. I mean, you were there, all the people were at the regatta. I mean, they did a good job dealing with all the COVID regulations and keeping the boat safe and keeping the regatta cool and fun. And everyone still was able to, you know, socially distance, socialize. And I, I got to say, you know, I'm not, you know, a class lifer by any stretch, but it was, it was fun to socialize with everyone, see how everyone interacted. And, um, you know, the racing was super clean. You never saw protests, never saw people fouling each other. I mean, it was really refreshing in my mind. I mean, it was awesome. It, I think it was spectacular. So I, I can't wait for the next event and doing more stuff. But um, anyway, uh, we didn't have too many more questions. But yeah, I, we saw that, you know, Dan Allen tells everyone to get to Clear Lake. which was only two hours from Eric's house in Minnesota. So maybe Eric will be there. Oh, yeah, I'll come down. Right, sure. exactly. Um, but you know, for all you guys, uh, you know, thanks for sending us questions. We look forward to talking to all of you. Here's our contact info. Um, we're thrilled to go to Sarasota. Our, our one little sales pitch, if any of you guys are interested in getting a new Magnum sale or rocket for the midwinters, uh, give us a ring. We, we only have a few in the production run left to go, but we do have a couple left. So if there's any of you out there looking for some new stuff and getting ready to try out the new sale, give Eric and myself a call. But um, we look forward to chatting with all of you and look forward to Eric. What do you think next week sometime we'll get the tuning guide out. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll, you'll see a blast from us with about new tuning and uh, you know, be sure to send us a note if you have anything. So thank you guys. We really appreciate it and look forward to seeing all of you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a good evening.